It's, it's wonderful to be here and wonderful to welcome our audience. We haven't seen a lot of you for a long time, so it's really great to have you here with us. And we're going to chat about the House Music at Your House program. And I'd like to begin by introducing our special guests, Nicole Forsyth and David Greco. And Nicole is a violist and the project director for House Music at Your House. Uh, she's artistic uh, curator of Bach Band at St James, resident St James Church, King Street, just across the road here. Um, and has been lead viola in many music groups during her career. Nicole lectures in the Historic Performance Division at the Sydney Conservatorium of Music and has a deep involvement in music teaching in schools. Her discography as principal and solo viola includes over 50 recordings for ABC Classics and other companies. And her PhD, supported by SLM, looks at the music collection of Rouse Hill Estate. And David Greco is a baritone who works at the cutting edge of historically informed performance in Europe. He has performed regularly with the Academy of Ancient Music and Amsterdam Baroque Orchestra and re regularly appears as a soloist with Australia's finest ensembles and orchestras, such as the Australian Brandenburg Orchestra, the Australian Chamber Orchestra and Sydney Symphony. In 2018, David released his debut recording with ABC Classic of Schubert's Winterreiser with keyboardist Erin Heliard. Last month, the ABC released the duo's follow-up album of Schubert's song cycle, Die Schöne Müllerin. David has also followed his passion for music history performance with a PhD. So the skill set of our guests is, is quite wonderful. Um, it's a combination of performance as well as research. They're very interested in the history of music, uh, so history as well. So it ties in very beautifully with our own project. Um, and I know some of you joined us last year for the QS Caledonians chat we had here. It's actually 15 months, which is extraordinary in our weird time scale that we live in now. Um, and that was with a similarly sort of talented group of people. It was with uh, David McGuinness and Brianna Robertson Kirkland from the University of Glasgow. Uh, and we discussed a really interesting program, program they worked on called Curious Caledonians, which was with Sydney University, University of Glasgow, and a great group from Melbourne called Evergreen Ensemble. And they worked together to explore Scottish music that had come to Australia in the 19th century. So they relied mainly on SLM's um, music collection to do that. And because they were all over the place, um, we were able to use our digital collections, our digitised music collections, which is the really important part of this project as well. Without that digitised collection, we wouldn't be able to do what we're doing at the moment. Uh, so it's, it's come in really good stead. Um, what's really exciting about the Curious Caledonians project is that we then had an ABC um, Classics recording that came out of the concert we did at Elizabeth Bay House, and that's just been nominated for an ARIA Award. So, who says that historical soundscapes aren't contemporary? So that's 2020. Um, so we're really excited about that. Uh, and we've now got 300 scores online um, on the Internet Archive. Uh, and the downloads are pretty significant. We've, over two and a half years, we've had 10,000 downloads. Of, I've got to admit, some pretty obscure music. Um, so it's really interesting to see what people are doing. And it's from all over the world, Russia, Vietnam, um, you know, apparently surprising places. Um, but before we hear from our guests, I think we should actually have a look at um, the website itself. Um, and you can see now we're scrolling down here and uh, there's a little intro video from Nicole. And there's some information about the project. And then as we head on, you'll see the songs. We're going to have 20 songs here eventually. And we're clicked in now to Home Sweet Home, which is one of the songs. And there's Amy Moore, who gives us a performance, and we're going to hear her in a minute. Uh, you can also download the score. We also have lots of examples on YouTube. And we keep going down, and there's actually information about who, how you might share your version with us. Uh, we meet the performer, there's Amy, and there's more information about her. And then other people's versions from the public are going up online. So here's Amy. Thank you. 
one year old, one of triplets, uh, who has submitted her version of Home Sweet Home. She's playing with her teacher who actually arranged this for her. So that's just to give you a little clue. So that's just to give you a clue, really, of how um, people might respond to, to the project. It's early days for us now. We've only got five songs up, I think, at the moment, um, but we will have twenty. But we're going to talk more about that. So, um, Nicole, can you tell us how this came around? Well, this is um, the public engagement <coughs> aspect of research is the most important thing for me. As a, um, I'm actually an ex-guide at um, Historic Houses Trust quite a while ago. And when I was working at both Government House and Vaucluse House and um, Museum of Sydney, the objects always had a story to them. They're still just an object. They're just a thing without the background story. And so in my life as a musician as well, in historic performance practice, I brought a thing, an object, a piece of music to life with my historic viola over there, which is 1820 viola and a 1791 bow. So when I got to work with the Rouse Hill estate music, it was important that this object that didn't make a sound eventually made a sound for the public to understand what it actually was. So music in context. So at, before the pandemic, I guess, I was looking at a kind of live public engagement and I started to write a play that included the music in it. And then when the pandemic happened, of course, we couldn't put people in a room together. So also in music and in the art sector in Australia, there is always opportunity out of disaster for anybody who works in it because we're working off the smell of an oily rag in the small to medium <laughs> sector most of the time anyway. So when City of Sydney put up um, their COVID resilience grants to explore the online space for the arts, I thought, ah, this will be great. We can do something with the digitised collection of Rouse Hill already. And into the bargain, I can hope to help employ some of the people who are amazing people, amazing musicians and performers and researchers themselves, who are just instantly out of live performance work because of the pandemic. So it was a combination of those two things. And City of Sydney Council, amazingly, said yes to the grant application. So here we are. And how have you been affected? I mean, it's obviously been a crazy time. Um, yeah. In terms of, and just in terms of making music, it's obviously been. Yeah. Well, there's just been none, has there? No, so, I mean, no. you know, projects like this are great. I mean, a lot of the content has gone digitally. Um, I'm lucky myself as a performer, a classical performer in Australia, because Matthew, the CDs that you mentioned, the Schubert with Aaron Hilliard, was recorded last year and was due yeah. for release recently. So, that was publicised by the ABC, and so I was grateful to have that, my art in a way, my my craft um, disseminated like that um, when I wasn't actually able to perform it. So that was lucky. But in terms of performing, it's been mostly, um, you know, at home, recorded a little bit of online content with uh, Pinch Cut Opera. Yeah. But yeah, it's, it's slim pickings. So this has been fun, you know, great, great initiative. We're lucky. Yes, and I mean, it was yeah, bigger, but... Um, yes, yeah, sure, it's, 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 Look, in a sense, I mean, we have to give City of Sydney such a lot of credit for moving so fast. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. the applications for this close in April, which is, when you think about it, it only really hit us in mid-March yeah. that we but, I mean, sort of realised... right on it. I mean, you, you know, kudos to Nicole. It was just... Oh, was no, she was there in a second, yeah, and yeah. we got that together really fast. Yeah. Um, and they, they moved really fast. So we knew by the beginning of June that the project was happening yeah. in terms of funding. Um, and then, well, we've all done a really great job in getting this so quickly. So beginning of August, we actually had the first songs up. The website was up and we were sort of getting it out there. Yeah, I um, think the whole online space is something, I mean, that we, SLM has explored it a lot anyway previously. And the funding from City of Sydney has given us this... Um, you know, a little bit of extra miles on the fantastic things that Sydney Living Museums have already done in the online space, which twins with your live engagement. So it's kind of exciting because we're doing something which is for now in the pandemic where people can't come in, but also perhaps for the future where engagement can be disseminated worldwide and that people 
in other parts of the world know much more about Sydney because we're able to put it out there on the web, which is exciting for me, I think. No, it is. And then remember, we do want to get it back in the houses at some exactly. point. Because it's yes. that place for us, which is so important. But it's, it's, that com it's always going to be that combination. Yeah. Um, and I think we were lucky that we had that enough music digitised. We've got a, over 100 Rouse scores digitised now. So uh, that was really handy. We literally pressed the button um, yes. and so we could use that stuff. But then also we've had years of thinking about the music collections here um, and that, that whole interest in provenance and the way music reflects on life in houses and we interpret all our houses and our museums and so this is an extension of interpretation. So we were able to press that button quite quickly. Um, and we've been working with lots of uh, researchers and music historians like Graham Skinner, who's given us a lot of help in, in understanding what we have in our collections. Um, but you've had that extra advantage now of spending time within Rouse Hill's collections for your PhD. Um, what are you finding and how, how did you even start to grapple this very large collection? It's a really big collection. It's, it's huge. Um, <coughs> Rouse Hill, we're really lucky that the, these things from Rouse Hill have been digitised, but it represents a tiny fraction of what is there at Rouse Hill, which is the really exciting thing about it. We're fortunate in that in 2004, um, volunteers worked with the curatorial and collection staff there to location record all the music in the house. So even though it might not be formally catalogued, at least we know where the piles of music are in the house. So um, to give you a little bit of background, if you haven't been up to Rouse Hill, it's fantastic. It's like, um, it's like your granny's house where she's kept everything from previous times. And the music we think was carefully packed away, perhaps with, I think now, that it might have been Nina, um, Nina Terry, Day Rouse, who was born in the house in the mid 1870s and lived there most of her life. And she preserved the house very carefully in its different layered states. And she, because she was also a really keen musician, she was taught piano and singing in her lifetime that she preserved the music collections there too. So, sorry, to answer how I went about it, um, working with the curators up there, Scott Hill and um, Carlin de Montfort at the moment, um, I went into each room and was able to actually quickly iPhone photograph nearly everything in the collection, wow. I think. So I've got zillions of photos on a drive. Um, and to look at things which had signatures of the family on them that had annotations in the music. And we find that as there is perhaps more formal music education in the family as we go along the generations, um, and to also through that process define where my writing um, and contextualising of the music, what time frame it would be, because it actually spans six generations of family, which progressively have more and more and more music education until we finally end with John Terry in the 20th century, whose PhD is actually a music, it's a music and composition PhD, mm -hmm. which is actually a really interesting, but not so uncommon in point for families in Australia that each generation is um, more and more interested in an art form and it ends with somebody who is that highly trained. So I decided that John's work, which is amazing contemporary composition and um, experiments in psychedelic music in the 60s and happenings and all sorts of fantastic stuff might be further research PhD for somebody who is working within the Australian music area and has all those connections. And then the period, very early period, because we're actually harking back to Judy's um, acknowledgement of country, we're dealing with a heritage site here, which is Darug Darkingen land. Um, and I'm just as interested in that sound, but it's not my job as Ballander, as Whitefella, to tell that story. Um, so that scope of research is yet to come from somebody who is related to those people. So I guess I'm looking at the period which is this album that we're currently talking about, about 1850 to about the beginning of the First World War, about 1914. Yeah, so two generations of family. And that's important, this album, we, we have really focused on one album. There's a little bit of music from another album that we're, we're showing in some of our SLM archival music clips, which we've included in there. Um, so it's, yeah, 1850s. Um, it's interesting to think about what it tells us about the fashion at the time. Um, I'm going to read you some of the titles of the songs that we've, we're, we're going to be recording and have been recording. So we have Home Sweet Home, we have The Letter, we have Sweet Home, 
we have Annie Laurie, we have Hearts and Homes, and then Light of Other Days, we have Catty Darling, Robin Redbreast, I Love Thee Still, Australian Flowers, now that's unusual, um, Castles in the Air, London Bridge, and All Things Love Thee. So I guess, what do you make of these pieces? Um, <laughs> What? There's a lot of love yeah. and home. <laughs> I think the, the idea of sentimentality about home and the domestic space was really growing mm. in um, the 1850s to Federation in 1901, that um, the notion of home was being explored not only in individuals' minds within their houses, but also, I guess, in the national psyche, where was actually home. And this is an interesting thing that comes up in the music um, and also in the, the composition of the music. Who are the composers? Are they from Australia or actually are they from England in a lot of cases too? Um, I think the sentimental notion of home is born out in the feminine space hugely in the late 19th century where women, I think the cultural sphere was trying to maybe corral women, particularly married women, into just the domestic space rather than some of the aspects that had come before in Australia where a lot of women came to Australia in the gold period to, um, to actually break those, um, those bounds of what was considered feminine. Um, and this was corralled a little bit as we went towards Federation. And I think maybe the music does reflect that um, that enculturation. The domestic yeah. space. Um, yeah. um, there's a lot of England there, obviously. I mean, as I said, there was only one Australian composer there. I, I, when, when this went online, um, someone did make a comment about, well, I'll start responding and I'll do you a version when I get an Australian composer, which was an interesting comment because you're not actually going to find many, um, or even composers who are making music here. Um, and it's not to say we weren't looking for them, because we we're always looking for them. Um, but that's the important point about what we've been doing at SLM with this soundscape, is that it actually isn't going to be Australian composers or the music that's collected by the National Library, for example, or State Library of New South Wales. They will focus on Australian composers. So it's actually an incredibly artificial representation of the sound of Sydney, New South Wales and Australia. Um, if we don't explore the other pieces of music that basically none of us have heard of, um, not that we will have heard the Australian ones either, but it's a very different soundscape. Um, and interestingly, a lot of people in England haven't heard these songs. Um, and sometimes we have the copies, only copies that are from their English publications, but they're here and they've lost them in England or they haven't catalogued them. So we get quite a lot of UK interest in what we're doing simply because we're opening up this world that they hadn't thought of particularly. Um, and it is this sort of time capsule that we have at Rouse, particularly of this amazing collection that's a bit lost. Um, yeah, I think the, the Rouses were the ultimate music consumers, as you said, in Songs of Home. Um, and it is an absolutely maybe typical Sydney consumer collection of the 19th century. And it reflects Sydney's um, great import and export mm. business at that stage that we were... Um, essentially a society of migrants, either forced or economic in the 19th century. And so they were bringing all that, all those different ideas from particularly Europe, but also from um, South Asia and from lots of other cultures around the world. But pub the, the evolution of publishing and printing, um, we particularly get those societies that have those industries going very quickly. So the UK, lots of printing and publishing from there. Um, the United States, different colonies of the United States, um, a little bit from Canada and some from mm. South Africa, not much. Um, and then local printing and publishing of works that were actually composed elsewhere in, 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 in the English language in the main. Yeah. It's, um, yeah. it's funny, Matt, you, I mean, you, you comment that a lot of these pieces that are found in the early domestic setting, they don't exist in collections in the UK anymore. I wonder if that's partly because being, you know, that being the mother country and us being the colony, we pr wanted to preserve the old country, whereas mm. traditions maybe moved forward in the old country and they kind of did away with that stuff, but we kind of championed it in a way because that represented the old world. I think that's true. There's possibly yeah, yeah, this, yeah. some of that, that, that strikes a chord with at least some of the, the narrative that I know, but uh, it's interesting where traditions would have continued in the UK from Europe and they would have thought, oh, we'll, we'll move on from yeah, that. But right. here yeah. it's just like, well, it's just we need that, you know.
It's interesting. Which is what we see with sort of later immigrants too. Yeah, of course. Ab- people hanging on to being, Italy or, or being in a, or, you know, half Italian. Italian yeah. Yeah. I can absolutely relate to this idea of, you know, um, first generation, second generation being a kind of, um, not an aberration, but kind of a, a, an accelerated or a, a, um, a heightened uh, form of what people and a romanticizing of what people mm. thought about the old country, you know? And, and we see that in the That often doesn't have a, a bearing on actually the original country anymore. No, no, it's moved on to something else. Well, we see Robin Redbreast, London Bridge. There are all these songs, they're all, I mean, they're singing about the Robins, you know, leaving, <laughs> you know, in the middle of Rouse it's really land. It's, it's, it's so much about, yeah, um, also in this volume and in other music that's a little bit later, 1880s, 1890s, 1910s, in Rouse that looks at spring in Europe, um, the Rouses were very keen on hunting and horses, but all their hunting and horse music relate to the English hunt and yes, chases yes, across yes, fields absolutely. and um, hedgerows and things like that, um, which is really interesting because you're there standing there looking at this music and in the summer there is this thrum of cicadas, you know, and that's the Yellow Monday of the Darug people. And then you hear the, the bellbirds, the binyang, and it's like, wow, okay, so we've got this in, intensely... Um, Australian nature going on around you and the sound, the sounds I'm particularly aware of as a music researcher. Um, and yet this, this beautiful reminder of the place that by that stage, by 1901, we've got five generations ago to, yeah, it's really interesting. And that tradition um, cuts across a lot of Australian <laughs> music as well. Yeah, it's, it's beautiful in, a, uh, in its disconnection. Yeah. Robin Red. Breast is actually a really sweet song. Um, and so Anna Fraser sings that. We'll be hearing that in a few weeks. Yeah. Um, that's, that's all in the can, but uh, that's coming soon. Yeah. And it's very, very sentimental and beautiful. It about is. The, the, dying, the dying sound of the robin in autumn who may disappear, die completely when winter comes and the snow. Yeah, yeah don't think there's ever been snow at Rouse Hill. Well, but, yeah. I don't know. We'll have to check that, but yeah. I, I, I doubt it. Um, so, so David, your, your, your first, first contribution, contribution um, is called Catty Darling, and yeah. we're going to play a little bit of it here. Um, and it's a sneak preview. It'll be coming out on Monday. So um, it's not actually up on the web yet, um, but we've got it already. And we have the score will be there. Uh, we have some guitar chords. Oh, and that's right. an important part of this, that not all the songs, but quite a few of the songs will have another format. So there might be guitar chords, mm. or there might just be an accompaniment. So you don't have to be able to read music. That's the important thing. Yeah. Um, or you can just sing along, or you can respond with a photograph. I mean, that's the, sort of the idea, or a poem. Um, it's quite interesting just reading the lyrics. The lyrics are all there as well. Um, and you just... It's actually worth looking at all of them, I have to say, you, to get your head in. We'll talk a bit more about this, getting your head into this place, which is not something we're used to, um, but you actually do. If the more you read, the more you really tune into this, this, this place in the 1850s. It's quite, quite special. So, Catty Darling, the clip we're going to show you, you're doing a couple of things. Um, you're going to play... Of one version first. You're going to sing one version first. Oh, do you want me to describe, describe a, a little, describe little, a little yeah, bit? Yeah. Yeah. So this this song, um, Catty Darling, uh, follows the practice of the time to take the early 19th century opera composers' big tunes and set them to the vernacular, or you know, simplify the melody, the key signature, the range, to um, to fit the domestic uh, scene and the amateur singer. And this is just a perfect example. This comes from uh, Vincenzo Bellini. Vincenzo Bellini's song Vaga Luna. And uh, he's, of course, the famous composer of Norma and La Sonambula, which received its first Australian premiere about two blocks away from here. Oh, really? Yeah, 1856, ah. I think. Um, and uh, yeah, so this, uh, uh, this would have found its way to Australia. And, and obviously, the composers of the time, it's funny, the early 19th century composers such as Bellini and Donizetti, is the first instance where composers worked with publishers to um, appropriate their songs to the domestic, domestic setting. I doubt that Bellini worked with publishers on Caddy Darling, but <laughs> it, it, this started to happen, exactly. But this starts to happen more and more, and this is a great example of this kind of, this practice. Yeah. So yeah, I play a little bit of the, the original song, Vagaluna, that I uh, sung just down the road as an undergraduate, you know, we all had to sing the Bellini songs. Yeah. Yeah. And then I played the, uh, 
the Catty Darling. Which I'm sure you never sung before. No, I don't know if anyone's sung I it for years. There are no recordings of it. Decades. No. Maybe that's not a surprise. No, I'm Spotify. not sure. But, <laughs> but now there is. There's one recording. Uh, and we want more people to do recordings yeah. as well, in any form, whatever they want to do yeah. with it. I think um, you've included also uh, Cecilia Barkley singing the original on the. I, we did. Yeah, at home. At home. In yes, July. It's actually, perfect. It's actually rather wonderful. It's really I, I actually had another recording of her on the stage doing her usual you mm, know, yeah, yeah, yeah. over the top wonderfulness. But then there was this other recording she's just recorded at home by yes. herself, accompanying herself. Yeah. It's really lovely. Throws in the kitchen sink. Yeah, that's great. So let's watch that. It's an opportune. So do you think of that when you're singing Katie Darling in terms of interpreting it? Um, does that impact the way you sing that parlor song, which is what it is? And then the question is, do we think the Rouses? Now they were probably aware it was Bellini. I'm not sure. Some copies have nothing on well, it. They don't mention Bellini. But others this. do. Yeah, all oh, right. Um, okay. Others do. Probably not the Rouse copies, but yeah. we have one copy from Throsby Park, which belonged to a governess at oh, Throsby really? Park. And she's written Bellini in. Oh, is that so? So it's not to say people didn't Interesting, get yeah. it. But in terms of your own interpretation, I mean, I guess, well, you know, it's a. Yeah. Do you do, you um, do that differently? Does it. Yeah, I think so. Well, I mean, I, I'm, I'm a professional classical singer, so of course, you know, um, I have a. And also, you know, my PhD was in 19th century performance practice uh, yeah. and vocal performance practice. So, I mean, if not me, then who, in a way, but certainly as, as, as a classical singer that studied Bellini and the performance practice of Bellini, I can't help but make that association with the simplified version of Catty Darling. And I do the same things that I would probably do, do in Bellini as I would in that song. And that's just, you know, treating the melody with with a bit of kind of rhythmic flexibility which these accompaniments if you hear and also the one that amy plays they're very early 19th century it's just chordal mm -hmm. and they're just um they're just arpeggiated so this this enables you to do something that was very stylistic in the time something we call tempo rubato where the the accompaniment stays steady and you the vocal line or the tune floats a little bit freely on top. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing we do is like a um, expressive sliding, which is from the time is what we call an Italian term called portamento, you know, sliding from note to note. It help, it, it brings out the pros, prosodic inflections of the words and the sentiment of the music. And you, you know, and, and the, Nicole does this on, on her 
violin, uh, viola, sorry. And uh, so, yeah, it, it translates for me anyway. For the Rouses, um, I guess so partly. I mean, I, I, they weren't professional musicians, though I'm sure they had an ear for what was going around. Maybe they attended the performance of Lust and Ambulance. And that is the question, yeah. what were they seeing? Yeah. And they say they were going to Sydney yeah. to, to see things. Yeah. What would they have been hearing? Well, I mean, what's, what's different to now? On, say we think of opera singers now. On, on, the, on, the, on the music it says, as sung by Anna Bishop, mm. yes. and she's the one that sang the first performance of yep. yeah. Sinambula. So it's very possible they heard her sing this, and she was very much, you know, the, the wife of Mr. Henry, Henry Bishop. Bishop. So, you know, she was versed in the early 19th century Italian style. I think, um, the, I mean, this bound volume that we're dealing with in, in this project is a really interesting one because there's a couple of songs in there that were Anna Bishop's solos in yeah. her concert tours of the colonies at this point. And as a researcher who really likes to try and find a story for why this music was bound together, um, we know that bound volumes of different pieces are bound together, usually by women, um, as either their favourite favourites at that particular point in time mm. or because there's something significant going on in their own life either they're married um, at that point or they're moving house so I wonder whether this was maybe Hannah Hannah's as she moved into the house maybe she had attended or the the Anna Bishop concerts and these were some of the favourites from the concerts saying, yeah. so even though it's hard to establish whether that generation actually had formal singing lessons in town. We know that um, the governesses at Rouse definitely had music as part of their accomplishments to teach the next generation. So this was Edwin, Stephen, Richard, Phoebe, Lizzie and Emma. Um, but I think the Rouses were of definitely of a social standing where coming into Sydney and going to concerts was a it was a big part of their yeah. life. Um, I wonder if they so were at Lust and Ambulance. That would be really interesting it would to know. Be wonderful Is there to anything know. in the in the records about attending it? So far, what I've been able to look at is just the music at Rouse mm. Hill House, the ephemera, so concert programs right, and things like yeah. that. We found for John Tenney, Terry's generation, the later part of the house, right. amazing things there with, you know, um, first performances of Peter Sculthorpe's Sun Music, for oh, instance. Wow, yeah, okay. But to go back to La Sonambula, that's a little bit more vague and it would be wonderful to have... I think we have to remember yeah. Anna Bishop was yeah. an absolute superstar. Yeah. Um, yeah. She, she, if you wanted to go, you'd be there. You know, she was just one of the biggest things that happened around the world. She was one of the first international stars, America, Europe, Australia. Australia made it the international. And Catherine Hayes going off to India. I mean, it was an extraordinary moment. And, and she was also a big talking point because she was Henry Bishop's estranged wife, uh, their, their relationship. And she was, she, uh, Home Sweet Home was her, her, her song. Uh, her husband had written it and she always sang it. Um, and she arrived with her lover, Nicholas Boxer, who was um, uh, Napoleon's harpist, formerly. Who is now buried in Newtown. Who is buried in Newtown. <laughs> Newtown. And he died here two weeks after they arrived. So it was a big story for lots of reasons. So you do imagine maybe um, that they might have got there. If, but I don't know. I don't know if that's true. But, um, and Anna Bishop, I was just going to say, with Catty Darling, it's really interesting. It expresses context is so important because, because Catty Darling was actually published in, I think, about 1849 in the musical bouquet yeah. with one set of words, quite sort of light. It was a lover wooing, wooing his, his maid, sort of standard fare, with, with the Bellini tune. Uh, then in 1851, an American version yes. was published, which is very dark, and he's lying at the, her grave. Yeah. Uh, it's a very different song. Dead, Same tune. Definitely, in the second Same line, tune. So, yeah. And then Anna Bishop arrives, and the versions we're seeing, and the one you sang at Rouse, it's sort of in between in that it's a, it's a, it's a lover um, singing to his, his maid, um, except I think he's dead um, or he's dying. So it's a, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a quite gloomy. Um, but it, you, could be, you could read it either way. And so that's, there's three songs. Well, it's the same song. Three lots of words within a decade. Um, three bits of the world. I think probably Anna Bishop may have had that version done for her and she's singing out in America and Australia. Mm. Doesn't appear really before her arriving here. No, and we've um, actually got two copies of that one do. at Rouse. So th there's the one in the bound volume there. And then there's another one loose in a, what we call a folio album, which is just a cover with lots of different sheet music, 
um, from different periods in the house, but the folio itself is stamped ER. And I'm hoping um, that that might be Lizzie Rouse. So that's, of, um, that's the children's generation at that point. And this would be a favourite of hers. And then there's other things inserted into that particular folio, which are definitely signed Nina and Kathleen Rouse. So it's an intergenerational folder. So I think Catty Darling in all its different forms, Catty and Katie Darling, remains a strong favourite in Australia. If people, even if people didn't know the Bellini original, they certainly knew the they knew it now. descendants it. of it. And so yeah. we're getting a lot about context through that song. It just varies all the time, yeah. which is the case with all these songs. Um, but if we think about what you've just been doing with Sir Schubert, um, so it's a form of domestic music. I mean, it's domestic music. It was domestic music, I think. Am I right saying that in, in Germany? Um, I mean, the, the, so the, so I mean the songs were appearing in England separately. Some, you know, there wasn't as a yeah, song cycle. It's been they were with publishing German, in the 30s. It's been tricky with German music because um, <clears throat> uh, 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 in, in opposition to the Italian music of the time, German art song had not made the emancipation from the domestic setting. Um, uh, professionals in the domestic mm -hmm. setting until about 18, late 1850s, early 1860s. Schoener Müller is the first, <clears throat> receives his first public performance, I think, by Julius Stockhausen and Clara Schumann in 1864. And so that's possibly one of the reasons why it took a while to come over here. And why in Germany, Germany, people were singing it at home? Yeah, I mean, yeah, and then it starts uh, to starts to I mean, creep into public domain. Yes, but it happened slowly. Yes. and opera was much more the the flavour, you yeah. know. And I think it's surprising for people here that really it was getting here so late. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. That, well, if it hadn't really made its way to the stages of Vienna yet, it was no. not going to come to Sydney. No, you know, so, not at all. No. Uh, yeah. Well, people don't realise Beethoven's really late coming. Yeah, here. right. I mean, his his death is recorded in the newspapers here, but really, and I think um, oh, it's the. Um, Jevons, who worked, who worked actually at the Mint, he was a famous economist, but he was here in the 50s. Um, in his diaries, he came to Sydney and complains about, oh, gee, the music's boring. And he said, I just want to play my Beethoven. So it's very interesting, even then in the 50s, that this Englishman is, is defining some sort of difference between right. what he's hearing in Sydney and what he wants to hear. But it's not, it's, it's different to the way we live now in terms of what's classical and what is popular. It's hard to understand now That's that sort of popular music the divide isn't the same, I is it, I, in the 19th I century? It's really, um, we can sort of say that, this, and you said this in your thesis, that the 19th century is the age of the singer and the pianist at, at best in terms of instrumentalists. Um, and certainly in Sydney in the 19th century, Graham Skinner's work really bears this out, that there was kind of no, um, no difference made between popular song and core classical yeah. canon song as we define it these days with, and I think that marker comes with the establishment of formal conservatoire music education in Europe and in the UK in the 1880s and onwards. So prior to that, we yeah. have this wonderful mishmash going on in around the world, but in Sydney, you know, particularly as this diaspora European and uh, colonial society. Chamber yeah. music also is funny. Yeah. I mean, chamber music in the, you know, the late 19th century, early 20th century really was lowbrow. It was the symphonic and opera was the rage. You know, chamber music was yet to come. It's now the other way around a little bit, was yes. yet to come to its own. So the, the whole kind of leader thing was just a little bit. And I know. think in Sydney, that's a really interesting thing for, you know, there's some, been some wonderful research done later on. Um, that chamber, chamber music as we know it now in terms of core classical canon chamber music really doesn't, doesn't start to exist in Sydney until we get the post Second World War sense, migration yeah. wave yeah. and the establishment of music, music of Eva. Eva, yeah. Um, because chamber music in Sydney prior to this comes from the idea of this mashup and um, music hall. So um, chamber music might have been a little band from what we know now as Tivoli or something like that and then those kind of bands that played for music theatre and for silent film do go on to form the Sydney Symphony with the establishment of the ABC in the 1930s. So it's actually, you know, this formation of symphony, modern symphony and modern conception of chamber music comes really quite late in Australia. And what we have before is this wonderful sort of swap over of mm. singers and pianists mm. in the main, in the professional sphere, 
and that that is because that's what they hear in Australia, the rage for people at home, that they want the latest song and perhaps the latest song arranged for piano to play at home. And so this is what we get mostly in the Rouse collection. Yeah. I think one of Graham's arguments has been really that up until about, well, the gold rush really, when everything starts rushing in, the money is coming in. And this is an expression of gold rush, that there's a lot of money starting to come in. Um, publications are starting to swamp us, that there's this sort of, and songs of home finished in about 1860, simply because sort of would argue there was at this moment before then that Australia was sort of this strange bubble. Stuff is still obviously being imported, but it's sort of the Australian version of the way we, whatever we can get, we're, we're interpreting. And it's not till the mass stuff comes in that we start to get this real sort of change in, and we see yeah. mass publication. Yeah. We've only got a couple of minutes, but we have to go to questions, believe it or not. We'll have to have another episode. Um, but um, what do we want to get out of this project? I mean, I'm thinking about, you know, in the 21st century, what do these songs mean? I mean, do they mean anything? Um, the words are odd often, they're, they're very sentimental. The tunes are absolute earworms. I mean, they drive you mad. I mean, my partner and I just sing in the shower. There's terrible, I mean, not terrible tunes, but they, you know, they're, they're these Victorian tunes. Can you stop it? Um, but I can't help it because they do really work. I mean, they're very clever. These comp I mean, Henry Bishop was a very clever composer and, and knew how to do a pop song. Yeah, I, so I don't quite know how we connect that with now, though. I, I think um, the idea that they're pop songs and also that you can put whatever lyrics to them yeah. is a really good one. That, Very serviceable um, music. Oh, it? extremely. Yeah. It's, easy to, it's easy to perform. It's easy to understand. It's easy, yeah, to put other words to. So I would love it, you know, if some of these tunes got back out there into the public domain and people wrote their own lyrics, used them for something else, um, that they become... Also in the, um, so in the public domain, we get them as pop songs again, perhaps in the um, formal music research nerd world that, that I live in the other half of the time, um, that these songs become considered a little bit more in terms of Australia's music, musical context history, that this is actually what was going on at home, that we really have to consider that the notion of the string quartet and the symphony didn't kind of permeate 19th century Sydney as completely as we think that we're really dealing with something yeah something a bit different to what we know today yeah and I mean as historically informed performers too I mean we know that we all look overseas yeah. <laughs> I mean that's what happens you know yeah. young performers and people studying yeah. instantly go overseas which makes complete sense and you should do it but we tend we've tended not to look at what happened here? It's a blank. Yeah, it's a bit I, of a blank. I think it's a really important thing to look at Australia's music of the past and Australia's musical context of the past because, and that is not just from 1788. I'm talking about learning about all our, me as a white fellow, learning about everything that comes from before and continues today. I'm lucky enough to have worked with wonderful Aboriginal communities in various parts of Australia and starting to learn their musical traditions, which tell us the story of who we are because it tells us the story of the land. So placemaking in music, um, we had something really unique here with mm. traditions coming from all over the world all the time, plus our own unique tradition here. And I think that is gold. I think that's amazing and that we should learn about it more and celebrate it more. And I should yeah. add that we, there will be an Aboriginal component to this project. I can't talk about it at the moment, but um, we're working on that at the moment with a, a wonderful person. And so, as with Songs of Home, where we had five Indigenous composers to actually respond and produce some great work um, as part of the exhibition, uh, that's always something that we want to continue to do. So I think we need to go to questions. Um, and I just want to say thank you to the Foundation as well um, and to our members and to the amazing team who's with us here in the room because they're weaving magic, I uh, hope. <laughs> um, and so it's really great to have you all here and just wonderful to have our audience here as well after a long gap. Um, so if we have any questions, I can start with a question because there is one that I, it's a basic one, is do you have a favourite piece from the Rouse collection? <laughs> Probably a hard one, it's really hard. It's really hard. There is, I have to say that my favourite bits of music exist in this fantastic treasure trove of drawers in, in one of the storerooms off the arcade. Um, and they're a little bit later and lots of them are signed by Nina and Kathleen. And I think that this particular bit exists from a time when they were putting on entertainments in the arcade. So they were staged bits of the Mikado and things like it. And 
the um, craze for Japan mm -hmm. is shown through the Mikado. So there's all sorts of dress ups in the house too. So there's kind of mini Amazing. operas going on um, and putting these entertainments on for people um, in the district. So that's kind of my, I can say that's my favorite bit of the collection so far. It's like a child going in and being able to kind of sit through all the music and it's all in bits and the covers are off and yeah, it's great. Yeah. yeah. And, and have you thought, thought of, you've, you've done, done Katie, Katie Darling. Darling, are there any others that you're sort of interested in? I think all the singers had to choose two pieces. And yep. so the other, um, the other piece, it, it may not surprise you, it's, um, it's also an, an operatic re -adap or adaptation. So it's Verdi and it's, a, you know, the most famous tune of all is La Donna Mobile from Rigoletto. Oh, yes, yes, yes. So you know, rum, bum, 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 ba, dum, you know, Lego's <laughs> Authentica. Yeah. Um, so, you know, and that was, that was a big uh, ripping famous tune. So yeah. yep, that's what I'll do. Yeah. Oh, that's great. And there is one question, um, relates to sort of the pedagogical value of this um, material. Is there a way we can use it in schools? I don't know. I mean, or, or I mean, you, you, you teach a lot in, in schools um, as well as at university. Um, are any of these tunes, I've got my mother learning one of these tunes, oh, she'll kill me, but I, um, and, and she's learning piano and um, it's actually quite, a, it falls quite nicely under the hands for a fairly early. I think these are eminently suitable at, at high school age and perhaps even some of my late primaries could, like Emmy who plays the cello, yeah. could have a go at these. Um, I have had some music classroom teachers say to me, this is a great way for year 11 and 12 Australian music topic to have a look at what was actually happening in their local area in, in the 19th century. So it's definitely got that application and music education in general within the Rouse collection is really shown by the number of piano studies and vocal tutors yeah. and music that goes from easy to quite I wonder, difficult. I wonder why in yeah. schools like when you have to study Australian music, well, I mean, why not? I, yes, this is European originated, but this is still Australian music and, yeah. and, 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 and featured in the Australian music making scene. So it's funny, it, it, that's, yeah. that should be visited. I think because we're dealing- I'd in, love to have- Yeah, I would have loved to have done this too. I think because it's- it Wonderful. What we frame as domestic music, non-core, non-core yeah. canon. It's not concert hall stage or wasn't what, well, we don't perceive it yeah. to be that. But since we look in school at music of lots of different traditions and world music and all the rest of it, um, that this is, I think, equally valid way of learning about the past. It has wonderful applications crossing yeah. into HSIE and all sorts of other um, yeah. learning areas at, at high school and primary school, I think, too. Yeah, there's stuff that's easy enough. Yeah. So my primary school students, please have a go. Yeah, that was a challenge <laughs> for you, yes. Yeah. Um, we have a question here about what was the availability of musical instruments during this period? For example, pianos, violas, and when did musical instrument stores get set up? Ooh. So, well, the, the early store, well, um, Francis Ellard was a very early um, music seller who arrived in 1833, I think. Uh, and he, um, he was fairly extraordinary. He, was, he came from a family of music sellers. Uh, his father, Andrew Ellard, was in Dublin. They came from Dublin. So dad stayed in Dublin, son came out. He was selling pianos. He was rebranding pianos, even though he was bringing them in. Um, he sold a lot of sheet music. And in fact, Rouse's very, very special volume called the Dowling Songbook, which is the earliest bound volume of music in Australia, not by the Rouse's in fact, but by another family, but it's ended up at Rouse Hill. Um, that contains a lot of music sold by Ellard to them in the 1830s. So it's really significant, as well as manuscripts, which is really interesting, copied by either Ellard or his convict copiers uh, and they're copying music out so it's almost like a photocopier wow. and they're printing um, and maybe the last copy that they had in the shop so they needed to copy that before the next one came in from England or they might have been copying on order someone says this is a favorite song I borrowed from a friend give me a copy mm. um, so Francis Ellard was a really significant um, early music seller in terms of instruments well the piano, I mean, the piano is the, the absolute height of aspiration in Australia. And we know that, of course, the first, the first piano was purported to have come with Surgeon Morgan. But the Rouses themselves, um, we know that they bought an Erard piano in 1855 from Parlings in Sydney. Um, and Erard was a French brand that was very um, 
a, a very kind of top class brand to, to be imported and buying in Sydney. So, um, and we think that a lot of this album that we've digitised and are currently discussing was probably accompanied by this Erard piano. Um, string instruments are a little bit um, hazier because of course they're very fragile and they kind yeah. of get, get damaged and destroyed e more easily. But we do know that a lot of the ads in the Sydney Gazette for the music emporiums, which existed at that period, which sold everything else as well. So there was, you know, um, bits for boats being sold at the same time as advertisements for strings. And of course, the yeah. um, Museum of Sydney holds a really significant string instrument, which is Mrs. Macquarie's cello. Um, whether Mrs. Macquarie ever played it as a question, but um, we think it was given then to the Pipers and Piper, and we're pretty sure it was used by servant bands for the Pipers. They had a great servant band. Uh, and so that's a very early cello that's been brought out and then given to Mrs. Macquarie. So they, they, that's very early. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And yes, I think that well, pianos certainly were imported because they were of high value and then the people who imported them could sell them on. Um, something like a viola or a violin or a whistle or an oboe, they weren't as valuable to import, so perhaps it was not quite quite as, you know, valued and they would, they would import a piano instead. Yep. I've got a question about gramophone records um, at Rouse. I mean, I know uh, people are looking at early recordings now, the way people interpret. There, there, well, there are gramophone records there, but they're later, obviously, than the period that we're talking about today, now in the 50s. Um, but people certainly do do research um, using gramophone records as a way of early, early recordings. Yes. And, and that's your PhD. So, David, yeah, that's your PhD. So, I mean, oh, dear. Well, that's another program yeah. that we need to. The, the gramophone records in Rouse, we know, were 78s, and there are only a few of them left. But they what are they, all? What are they all? Um, Italian tenors. Oh, great right, Italian okay, yeah, tenors. Um, yeah, uh, the Italian, Italian song um, and lighter music in yeah. general, but there are, there is Mozart there as well. Right. Um, uh, what is the value of homemade instruments, spoons and washboards? Ah, oh, now oh, the, you're and... touching on a great question there, I think. Um, this has been beyond the scope of my PhD research at Rouse, but I'm very aware that Rouse Hill is situated in an area where there was huge oral and oral transmission of the folk musics of Ireland and Scotland through the the workers who are out there, oh, wow. um, but it's all, you know, it's oral history and this is perhaps for someone else to have a look at, but I think, you know, definitely out there in the little townships that were springing up beyond Windsor and Richmond and the people who worked on all these big properties, yeah, so. I mean, it's not a homemade instrument, but the, the little Jews harps were incredibly popular. They were everywhere um, and that's the sort of stuff you would have been hearing all around. Yeah. Rouse and, and all of New South Wales. There were sort of different grades, expensive, cheap, you know, and um, they were a very popular sort of basic instrument. Yeah, yeah. and I think that the oral transmission of music is just as important as the written, but perhaps a harder, um, a harder category to research because it relies on people's oral memories of things, which are, yeah, fantastic. It's a little bit more time consuming. So that's your yeah. Fortieth PhD. Yeah. <laughs> We've got a few of them to come. Um, so look, I'd like to thank everybody. It's been a terrific discussion. Thanks for coming, and thanks to our audience for coming as well. And I'd like to hand over to Judy to say goodbye. I'd like to thank again Matthew, Nicole and David for being so incredibly generous with your talent and wisdom and insights this morning. Um, I would also like to acknowledge my team members, Kate Sheaf and Kim Ho. You can't see Kate and Kim, they're behind the scenes putting in all the hard work and long hours involved in producing an event like this. And I'd also like to thank you, our active members and donors, because it's only thanks to your support that we're able to share this content with our ever increasing audiences. I invite you to 
tell your friends and family about your involvement with Sydney Living Museums. We're always welcoming new members and we've made it as easy as possible for you to support our work by going to our website at sydneylivingmuseums.com.au and um, utilizing the rather hard to miss donate button. Um, but the reason we've done that is to support this work is important and the support that we have allows us to be more innovative and creative in how we present this important content. So thank you again for spending time with us today and we look forward to seeing you at the next event at Sydney Living Museums.